Who are we now? <laughs> Who are we going to be? How do we begin? Welcome to the Edmonds Unitarian Universalist Congregation. I'm Eric Kamenetsky, and along with the Reverend Crystal Zerfoss and the Reverend Cecilia Kingman, we serve as the ministry team for this congregation. Welcome to you, old friends and new, young and old. You are an essential part of our celebration today. Whether today is your first or your thousandth Sunday in our midst, we are stronger because you are here with us. We are one people of many beliefs, many origins, sexualities, and genders. We are all growing, all learning, all loved, just as we are. If this is your first Sunday with us, we're guessing you want to know more about us and we want to know more about you so we can help you connect with the things you are hoping to find in a faith community. If that sounds good and you are on site with us this morning, please find me after this service and say hello. I'll introduce you to a member of our welcoming team and you can ask questions and find out more about us. If that sounds good and you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, please go to our website at euuc.org, euuc.org. Click on the tab that says I'm new and you'll find a link to our visitor form. I think it's called What Are You Interested In? If you're on Facebook, you might even see a link for that form in the comments below. However you get to your visitor form, if you fill it out, we'll send you more information about who we are and about who you can become if you choose to explore this amazing congregation. What happens after that is up to you. We invite you choose. So in a moment, the service will begin, but immediately after this service, many of us who are online and who are already a part of this congregation will gather on Zoom for a virtual coffee hour featuring conversation and community. And if you're online and you can manage filling out that visitor form, we'll send you a link that will allow you to join us for coffee hour next week after the service. If you're here on site, and you'd like to gather to socialize after this service, please go out to the playground area. We got a Vote Rocks activity out there. You can socialize. You can watch the children stomp around on the play set. Again, we invite, you choose. But please know that we would love to have you come back for Sunday service next week and stay for coffee hour. And now, we open our service with a land acknowledgement, followed by a call to worship. And after that, we will light our chalice for the first time in over two years. Let us remember that our congregational home, this place from which I am preaching, is placed on the ancestral lands of the Snohomish people who have inhabited this region of the Salish Sea since time immemorial and who continue their livelihoods on these lands today. May we all live and learn humbly as allies to the Snohomish. And I can't tell you the joy it brings me to hear the voice of a very young person in this hall. I'm just filled up. My colleague, Crystal Zerfoss, brings the call to worship. Crystal. Our call to worship this morning is entitled, Call from Beyond, written by US Navy Chaplain, Susan McGinn. From beyond the playful summer clouds, beyond the earth's thin blue line, from beyond the bright moon and meteor showers, 
we hear the call to look and listen carefully, to turn away from a world that buys and sells happiness, to fully experience the luring whisper of your heart's truth. Why not today? Why not now? We are here and together at home in this evolving place, home in this ever-changing breath and body, home in this dewy morning, even as it reaches toward a high, hot noon. We hear the call from far beyond and deep within, and we do not hear it alone. Come now and let us worship together. Each week we gather, we place a flame in the bowl of the chalice. By this committing and completing a sign and a signal of our Unitarian Universalist faith tradition. Our chalice words this morning are a remembrance of a moment from 2010. They are shared by my colleague, the Reverend Lisa Day. I'm sharing them with you this morning because it's been so long and because I want us to be thinking back and feeling forward as we learn how to be together again. Chalice lighting for challenging times. Abdul Sattar Rahimi, the deputy director of the Farah Provincial Council, holds his prayer beads during a ribbon cutting ceremony March 8th. Why oil for the anointing, healing? Out of chaos, fear, and horror, thus was the symbol created a generation ago. So may it be for us in these days of uncertainty, sorrow, rage, joy, and wonder. A light to warm our souls and guide us home. Our special music comes from our hymnal, which we have not distributed this morning. We won't even have the words up on the screen, though I've asked Nick Maxwell to play hymns for us. We're not yet safe to sing in this hall. So if you're online and you know the words, please sing away. But if you're here on site, here at the Edmonds Unitarian Universalist Congregation, you are welcome to sing in your head, to sway with the music, and to enter, rejoice, and come in. And between you and I, I don't think anybody's going to yell at you if you hum a little. Each week that we gather, we say words of an affirmation. 
We say them for ourselves, for each other. We say them to ourselves, to each other. You are welcome to say them or think them or feel them. Please join us in our affirmation. We need each other. And so we come to this place to work and dance and laugh and cry and think. We call ourselves a religious community, not because this place is in itself holy ground, but because what we do here and say here and are here make it so. So let it be. We're now going to share in the time for all ages. I invite you to snuggle up close to those you are with and listen to our story. For those of you who have been around for a while, you may remember that we've been talking about how Unitarian Universalists affirm and promote principles which we hold as strong values and moral guides. And for those of you who may be newer, we live out these principles through our actions and how we are in relationship with each other. We draw upon many sources of wisdom, such as science, poetry, scripture, and personal experience to understand them. We lift up six sources of wisdom as foundations of our faith, and today, we're going to talk about our sixth source. Our sixth source of wisdom is the spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions that celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. These spiritual teachings come from pagans, Wiccans, Native American tribes, just to name a few groups. They teach us to live in harmony with nature and Mother Earth. They also celebrate and honor the sacred circle of life, the process of getting ready for new life, new life emerging, living daily life, and then dying. We, as Unitarian Universalists, get some of our rituals from Earth-centered traditions, such as calling the directions. This is a practice where we, the community, call upon the spirits of the directions to be with us as we gather. Oftentimes, the leader of the group invites folks to face the direction you are calling, and they offer some words. If we, it's like, so if we all faced east, which way is east in this sanctuary? This way. So if we turned around and if, well, if you all just faced straight ahead and I turned around and everybody online looked to the east, I would say, spirit of the east, spirit of air, of morning and springtime, be with us as the sun rises in times of beginning, times of planting. Inspire us with the fresh breath of courage as we go forth into new adventures. And then we would all say, hail and welcome. We would do this for each of the four directions and four elements, water, earth, fire, and air. Some people also face the center and welcome spirit there or they use the four directions, plus above, below, and inward. Then, after the worship service or the ritual is completed, you release the directions by bidding the spirits farewell and thanking them for their presence and blessings. Another practice we use employ is celebrating some of the pagan holidays and festivals. Maybe you've participated in celebrating solstice, whether it's the summer solstice on the longest day of the year, 
or winter solstice when we celebrate the returning light on the shortest day of the year. Many UU churches host a burning bowl ritual on New Year's Eve where folks get together and pray and sing and honor the turning of the wheel, the changing of the year. They think about what they hope for for the new year and what they want to release from the past year. And then they write these down on little slips of paper. Then they take turns burning up their pieces of paper in a big fire in the middle of the gathering. It's a beautiful tradition that comes from earth-based spiritualities. And another holiday that gets celebrated is Beltane, which I don't know if you know, but today is Beltane. Beltane falls halfway between the spring equinox, Astera, and the summer solstice. Some people call it May Day. On May 1st, today, we celebrate spring and the coming summer. It's also a time to celebrate fertility, the ability for people and animals to have babies. One thing that people do to celebrate Beltane is to decorate a maypole. Have anybody here decorated a maypole before? Oh, there's a bunch of folks here. Um, a maypole is a giant pole in the ground that has colorful ribbons hanging down from the top. Sometimes it's decorated with flowers on the crown at the very tippy top. Kids and adults alike each get to hold one of the ribbons on the maypole. They stand in a circle around the pole as the music begins. Then they all dance around the maypole pulling their ribbons with them as they weave a colorful pattern. They dance, until, they dance around until the pole is completely wrapped in ribbon. It's a fun activity for everyone. And then the community has a beautifully decorated maypole to celebrate belting. All of these rituals and practices are examples of ways that Unitarian Universalists draw upon and use earth-centered traditions in our worship. We also use the teachings of earth-centered spiritualities to help us understand how to be better stewards of the planet and recognize our part in the interconnected web of all existence. We are connected to nature in magical ways and there is so much we can learn from observing the natural order of life. Naturalist John Moore tells us, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, one finds it attached to the rest of the world. We hear this in our seventh principle. We affirm and promote respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. In other words, we believe in caring for our planet Earth and the home we share with all living things. And that's something that we've learned from Earth-centered traditions. Just like our other sources of wisdom, the teachings of Earth-centered traditions provide us with a wide range of inspiration, learning, and beautiful rituals. Let's give thanks for this wisdom and keep growing from it. I wish you a happy Beltane and a blessed spring. It's so good to be with you. Thank you for sharing in the time for all ages. I hope you have a great week. For a moment's peace, if you'll settle in where you are, put your feet on the floor if that's comfortable for you, loosen up your shoulders and your neck, settle your head on your body in a comfortable place, and breathe in a way that works well for you. 
we're going to enter a time of quiet. Before we do, I'll invite you to soften your gaze or close your eyes. I'll bring you out of the time with the words, may it be so. But let us enter this time of quiet, this time for prayer or meditation or thinking or not thinking if you do a little too much of that. Please breathe. May solace come upon you, power rise within you, and peace settle on your heart. May it be so. Our special music, number 128 from our hymnal, for all that is our life. Our first Sunday with people in this building and on screens out in the world. Our first time on site in over two years and our first time to be together in this way. Welcome. In addition to being Beltane, this is also the end of Ramadan, at least in our local time zone this evening. The celebration of Eid will happen. It's International Workers' Day today, which is slightly different than Labor Day, but still something to pay attention to. And we're beginning anew. And the good news is that we're together. What a gift. Now, some of us can remember what it was like in the before times, before the pandemic, when things happened in a fairly predictable way, Sunday after Sunday, month after month, and year after year. But some of us have found our way into this beloved community since the pandemic times. And we only know this as a place on our screens or perhaps in the parking lot of this congregation. 
And some of us have chosen membership, having never set foot on this site or inside this hall, Chapman Hall, before this day or even on this day. This hall, named for founding members, Maybell and Stuart Chapman, in some ways, this is a first day, a new day, and the first time for lots and lots of things. This dais, or chancel we're on this morning, is brand new, designed and built by members of this congregation. It's at a different height than the old one. It's differently shaped. It has different functions and colors and textures than the one that was here before. And this low wall behind me and to your right sets off an Americans with Disabilities Act compliant ramp we built so that those who roll and those for whom steps are troublesome have a way to get on up here. It's a new day, a brand new day, here at the Edmonds Unitarian Universalist Congregation. And this brand new day reminds me of another brand new day. This brand new day reminds me of May 8, 2010, the first time I showed up on this property for the first day of our candidating week. That was a long week, a long time ago, when this congregation and I, as we were then, interviewed each other to see if we wanted to make beautiful music together. But what I'm remembering in particular from that first day is walking into our facility from the administration wing and walking all the way across the place to the triple glass doors of our atrium, which most of you entered this morning. And as I was walking toward those front doors, I noticed an older woman bending down, pulling taped signs off of one of those doors. And as I got closer, she stopped what she was doing. She looked up at me and she asked, are you here to help? <laughs> I said, I think I am. <laughs> and then I asked, what are we doing? Well, she said, we're trying to get the place cleaned up. What for? I asked. Because the new minister is coming today. <laughs> and we want the place to look nice. Then narrowing her eyes a bit, <laughs> she looked at me and said, who are you? We'll get back to that story in a moment. This hall, Chapman Hall, and this whole facility were so different back then. The windows in Chapman Hall were made of plexiglass. There's a whole story about why that was. This chancel was carpeted in a bluish gray, and the carpet in the narthex and the atrium where you walked in was red. That carpeting had been repurposed from a Boeing facility by one of our members who worked there and who noticed all these rolls of carpet getting ready to be thrown out that still had a lot of life in them. Some of that Boeing carpet still lives in the administration and faith development wings of our facility. I'm pretty sure it's been with us since the last millennium, <laughs> and I'm quite sure it came to us used but we have reused the heck out of that carpet. Back then, our chalice was an exotic brass-colored fixture. You really had to know the ins and outs of our sound system in order to make it work. And our roof leaked. Our roof leaked here, and our roof leaked there, and our roof was a perennial 
item on the agenda of the Board of Trustees. That was before our car camp for the houseless, before our community garden, before the public park quality playground equipment that our children stomp around on, and before the new roof. I remember one board president claiming as their stated goal that before they were done, we were going to have an entire year's worth of board meetings without talking about that roof once. <laughs> and true to that board president's vision, we got the roof fixed. And we really didn't talk about it for the next year. And we really don't talk about the roof now because the roof doesn't leak. Oh, beloveds, back then, there were more original members around here, founding members, folks who had been around here since the beginning, people who had seen ministers and congregational homes and congregational names come and go. Now I think we may be down to one of those original members. That would be Marion. Marion was ele elevated to the role of deacon during the era of Robert Fulgham's ministry. Now, I'm not sure, but since we're not real big on titles around here and because we try to take our responsibility seriously and try to wear our authority lightly, Marion may be the only deacon we've ever had. At any rate, so many memories. But about that other story I was telling you. On May the 8th of 2010, I walked into this facility from the administration wing and I walked all the way across the place to the triple glass, glass doors of that atrium. And as I was walking toward those front doors, I noticed an older woman bending over, pulling taped signs off of one of them. As I got closer, she stopped what she was doing, looked up and asked, are you here to help? And her gesture, that gesture, is purely emblematic of what this congregation is about. You walk in, and even if nobody knows who you are, you're going to be invited to help bring the place to life. Because everybody has a role in bringing this place to life, even you. Are you here to help? She asked. I said, I think I am. And then I asked, what are we doing? Well, she said, we're trying to get the place cleaned up. What for? I asked. Because the new minister is coming today and we want the place to look nice. And then, narrowing her eyes a little bit, she asked, who are you? Well, I said, I think I'm the new minister. That older woman was Mary Emmons. And to my understanding, Mary was doing a pretty spot on impression of EUUC founder Maybell Chapman. <laughs> Maybell Chapman, one of the folks after whom this hall is named, I am told would stand in the atrium with her clipboard just inside those triple glass front doors waiting for you to come on through. And as you come through, Maybell would stop you, greet you, look you up and down, look down at her clipboard, make a mark, and volunteer you what your new church job was gonna be. <laughs> and whatever Maybell said was pretty much how it was going to be. Now, a bunch of years have rolled up on us since then. A bunch of years since that first day in 2010, and I'm glad to report that we're still here. I mean, not all of us. The years have claimed some. The 
pandemic claimed some more, and others have found places that suit them better. But a bunch of us are still here. And we've been joined by a gracious plenty of folks ever since. So in some ways today feels a lot like that first day in 2010 because we are beginning anew again together. So who are we now? Who are we going to be? And how do we begin? That's a set of questions lots of Unitarian Universalist congregations and ministerial candidates are asking right about now because this is the season of candidating weeks all over UU land. It's a time when congregations and ministers are hoping to find out that they've found a good fit and that they're making a good match. And for many of our communities, the future is bright and hopeful. Congregations, search committees, and ministers in search ask questions like, who are we now? Who are we going to be? How do we begin? The poet, John O'Donohue, invites us into those questions for a new beginning. In out-of-the-way places of the heart where your thoughts never think to wander, the beginning has been quietly forming, waiting until you were ready to emerge. For a long time, it has watched your desire, feeling the emptiness growing inside of you, noticing how you willed yourself on, still unable to leave what you had outgrown. It watched you play with the seduction of safety and the gray promises that sameness whispered, heard the waves of turmoil rise and relent, wondered, would you always live like this? Then, the delight, when your courage kindled and you stepped out onto new ground, your eyes young again with energy and dream, a path of plenitude opening before you. Though your destination is not clear, you can trust the promise of this opening. Unfurl yourself into the grace of beginning that is at one with your life's desire. Awaken your spirit to adventure. Hold nothing back. Learn to find ease in risk. Soon, you will be home in a new rhythm, for your soul senses the world that awaits you. So, who are we now? Well, in some ways, we are who we've always been, a people captured by our mission, gathering together, nurturing the spirit, living our vision of a just and sustainable world. We gather together to strengthen our souls because we know it's in community that we nourish particular parts of ourselves. Even the introverts among us know that's true. And while it would be accurate to say that I can be seduced by the recliner in our family room, it is equally accurate to say that I yearn to be with you, to know you, to learn about you, to work and play and celebrate with you. I spent much of my youth growing up in the Unitarian Church in Summit, New Jersey, now known as Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Summit. And one of Beacon's many ministers, because it's an old congregation, was the Reverend A. Powell Davies, a 
towering figure in Unitarianism and very much a Unitarian of his time, particularly in the way he spoke about hope. He came from English Methodism to Unitarianism, so God language is natural for him. Before I was born, he wrote, I'm going to church. And within that, he wrote, why I go to church. So this is an ex excerpt from Why I Go to Church by A. Powell Davies. I want to experience human nature at its best and be reminded of its highest possibilities. And this happens to me in church. It may seem as though the same things could be found in solitude, but it does not easily happen so. In a congregation, we share each other's spiritual needs and reinforce each other. We meet each other as friends and neighbors anywhere and everywhere, but we seldom do so in the consciousness of our soul's deepest yearnings. But in church we do, in a way that protects us from all that is intrusive, yet leaves us knowing that we all have the same yearning, the same spiritual loneliness, the same need of assurance and faith and hope. We are brought together at the highest level possible. We are not merely an audience, we are a congregation. I doubt whether I could stand the thought of the cruelty and misery of the present world unless I could know through an experience that renewed itself over and over again that at the heart of life there is assurance that I can hold an ultimate belief that all is well and this happens in church. Life must have its sacred moments and its holy places. The soul will always seek its nurture. For religious experience, which is life at its most intense, life at its best is something we cannot do without. End quote. We need each other, and so we come to this place. Nurturing our spirits with music and community, with worthy works, and in the presence of those we come to know as a part of the beloved community, we are provided the opportunity and the possibility of becoming whole. And together and apart, we make choices about how to be with ourselves, how to be with each other, to make communication, connection, and community work, how to be in the world in order to bring support for peace, justice, and sustainability. My beloved colleague, the Reverend Joanna Fontaine Crawford says, we are gathered to strengthen our souls. We are sent out to strengthen the world. Who we are now is a community and a congregation on this side of that pandemic. Our old congregational home is being updated to better meet the needs of this time and the times to come. And come this fall, we will have Melanie Damore and Eric Lane Barnes joining us to help bring the music out of us and into the world. How we are going to be together is always a beautiful work in progress. And we've got some work to get done. We need to fund our beautiful work in progress by finishing up our annual pledge campaign. To make your pledge of financial support, you can go to our website, euc.org, and click on the giving link. And please, get your pledge in. Our board needs your support to build a reliable budget Later on in May, please gather with us for our annual congregational meeting where we'll vote on that budget and take up some other important decisions.
come June, we'll be celebrating at the General Assembly in Portland, Oregon, online or on site. General Assembly is where lots of Unitarian Universalists gather to celebrate and do the business of our association of congregations. Finally, and beginning this very day, and for every day that follows, we will be learning how to be together in all these new ways. We begin anew together. We are beginning anew. And how I hope and pray that we will begin anew with a little grace, a little patience, and a little humility. And how I hope and pray that we will begin together so that we can renew our congregation, continue building our beloved community, and continue to be a light to warm our souls and guide our way home. May our hopes and prayers become reality. Let us make our hopes and prayers our reality. Blessed be. Amen. It is good to be with you. Our special music is This Little Light of Mine, an African-American spiritual brought by Nick Maxwell on our piano. It's so lovely to hear the piano in this hall. Just lovely. Each week that we gather, we take an offering. And if you're new to our gathering, it's important for you to know that EUUC's weekly offering goes right out into the world to support organizations doing good works that align with our mission, gathering together, nurturing the spirit, living our vision of a just and sustainable world. 
The Reclaim Our Vote campaign is the Sunday offering cause for May. The Reclaim Our Vote campaigns are a project of the Center for Common Ground. CFCG, the Center for Common Ground, is a people of color founded and led nonprofit and nonpartisan organization. It seeks to create a more just and inclusive democracy by protecting the right to vote, combating voter suppression, and promoting active voting. It works in nine states, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, and Arizona. Campaigns include postcards, phone banking, and establishment of community-based grassroots-led democracy centers. If you are online today or if you are on site and have your phone in hand, you can go to the Giving tab on the EUUC.org website and look for the Offering Cause of the Month. If you're on site today and you have cash or check with you, there is a basket out in the narthex where you can contribute. In this piece of COVID time, we're not passing from hand to hand. Regardless, please be generous within the limits of your budget. And we have a couple of announcements so that you can know a little bit more about what goes on at this place and what's coming up. Again, you're welcome to join us out there. You'll see some folks and some uh, tables for the Vote Rocks activity. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be having our annual congregational meeting on Zoom on Sunday, May the 22nd at 2 p.m. Pacific. There are several important things for us to take care of, including passing a budget for the next year, adopting the eighth principle, which we've been talking about, and authorizing the sale of the East properties. In the run-up, to our annual meeting, Board President Rachel Maxwell will be holding several gatherings over the next few weeks to give you an opportunity to learn about and talk about these issues. Tomorrow is May the 2nd, and on May the 2nd and on May the 9th at 7 p.m., we will share a summary budget and answer your questions about the budget, the 8th principle, and the East property sale. There will be a Zoom link sent out so you can participate in those. In addition, we'll have an additional special meeting specifically about the potential sale of the East properties on Thursday, May the 12th at 7 p.m. Now, if you're signed up for our weekly email bulletin, you should wind up with all kinds of emails about all this stuff, but it means you have to actually open up your machine and read your email <laughs> and maybe check your spam folder and all that stuff. No decisions will be made at these meetings I've just talked about, these May 2nd and, and 9th and 12th meetings. They are times for you to come and learn and talk so that when we get to our annual congregational meeting, uh, we can make decisions. Our annual meeting is a little bit too big to have meaningful conversation. That's why we try to have these smaller meetings ahead of time so maybe you have 10 or 20 or 30 people trying to manage a conversation, which tends to work a lot better. We look forward to meeting you at these little meetings and at the big meetings and online and out at the playground and all over the place. My face is just exhausted from smiling. I am so glad to be with you, beloveds. Thank you for being with us today. We love you and we look forward. We will be doing this same thing next week the same way, maybe even a little better. Who knows? And now we will carry this flame with these closing words. We release this flame, but not the light of truth. We release this flame, but not the warmth of this community. We release this flame, but not the fire of our commitment. These we will carry in our hearts until we meet again. Nick Maxwell, can we have some walking out music? Thank you for being with us, beloveds. We love you.
face hurts. <laughs> there you go. I guess I'll pick this thing up later. Oh. 